Hey. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Knights of the Pageless Library. I am Bo Knight, and with me, as always, is Ryan Knight, and we are a little podcast that reviews audiobooks, and today we are look, taking a look at Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, narrated by um, Tom Tim Robbins. The famous that's, that's right. <clears throat> so, like Bo said, we are a... Uh, a small podcast, and we're trying to grow. So, if anyone and everyone could do us a favor, just uh, whatever you're listening on, if you could just go in and uh, give us five star rating, or or not, I mean, whatever you want, you know. Yeah, give us I'll... the appropriate rating we deserve. That's right. Yeah, I, actually, exactly. But you know, it's uh, it it it'll help us out. So, if anybody could go do that, and then if anybody wants to email us and let us know how we're doing. Uh, K-O-T-P-L dot pod at gmail dot com would be the easiest way to get a hold of us. So with that, we will talk about Fahrenheit 451. So like Bo said, this is narrated by Tim Robbins. We got this off of Audible, uh, which is pretty much where we listen to all of our audiobooks. Uh, I don't even know that I would recommend another place to listen to them. I, I don't even know of another one. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> so um, just keep that in mind, though, as we go through this review, is that uh, we're listening to the Audible version narrated by Tim Robbins. So if you, like, go to YouTube and just listen to some random person read it, then your experience will probably be different than ours. I can almost guarantee it'll be worse. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee that, too, actually. Um, yeah, so... Fahrenheit 451, the original book. This book is old, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, it came out in 1951, I think. And I'm pretty sure you're right. So this is a pretty old book, but the audio version we're listening to was actually done in 2014. So it's actually relatively new. Um, let's and I see. think there is another... Um, there is another version of the audiobook read by a completely different person. There might actually be two other ones. Yeah, so as people are going through on Audible, if you're looking for Fahrenheit 451, just Tim Robbins, I believe, reads the um, English version, and I think there's a few other versions that are not in English, so you might just want to keep an eye on that when you're going to, if you go to purchase this book. So. Um, you could currently purchase this one for nineteen ninety five. Yes. Um, it is five hours long, so it, that's actually a little expensive for the length of the book. Actually, yeah. But I, I okay. <laughs> Sorry. But just wait till we do our uh, recommendations on this one to uh, make that judgment call. So yeah, Ray Bradbury, I mean, he's written lots of good things. I mean, you probably read a lot of him growing up. I know we, I, I did. I certainly didn't appreciate it back then. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, he's, he's a well-known author, I think, for a reason. Right. Yeah, and he's mostly known for like sci-fi fantasy fiction novels. Uh, and a lot of his books are considered classics. Yeah. But is Fahrenheit 451 a classic, the audiobook? I don't know. <laughs> Just don't know yet. And so the fact that this is narrated by Tim Robbins is actually kind of cool. It's um, super cool. Yeah. And Tim Robbins does an incredible job reading uh, this book. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think this is like my favorite performance in any book. Yeah. He... Uh, I'm, I would almost go as far as to say that as well. And I mean, I, I like some uh, narrators <clears throat> that do a lot of, you know, I like my Bronson Pinch shows, you know, and those kind of guys. But Tim Robbins does an incredible job on this book. Um, his inflections are spot on. 
he he sells the characters that he is portraying just to a T. I mean, he he does a really really good job in this. His range of voices is incredible. Yes. Yeah. I I, I don't like. There's almost not. There's like nothing bad I can really say about him in this. I think he does an incredible job, as Ryan said. Yeah, I, I don't think I have any complaints either about his performance in this. I thought it was was definitely, you know, top tier for sure. Top top tier. This is this is the like the rare double S. Yeah, actually, so yeah, that's that is important to say because I mean we'll talk about this a little bit in our recommendations, but I mean you're basically getting a good book with a great narrator. So if this story was good for someone who read the book I would say that Tim Robbins makes it even better listening to him tell you the story. I 100% agree. So the genre of Fahrenheit 451. Fahrenheit 451 is kind of a uh, dystopian future type of book. Actually, it's not yeah. even really future. It's not really future anymore, is it? Because I'm pretty sure in the book, they don't say exactly when, like what date the book is set in. I would say it's quote unquote future. However, pretty sure they mentioned the year 2023 in the book. So it's not Thank like you. it's not like super far in our future, it, but it was definitely in Ray Bradbury's future when he the, wrote this back. Dude, in the scary thing is the things he gets right. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And we'll definitely get into that because, yeah, it's. <laughs> Between freaking Ray Bradbury and George Orwell, I could have nightmares daily. What do you mean could have? <laughs> um, so like I said, this book is five hours. So it's actually a really short book. Uh, I mean, you could easily finish this in a car ride. It's Yeah, you it's could. Short. You could. But I have a lot to say about that, too. Um, do you think this book was easy to follow? No, I don't think so. Okay, I'm but glad I we agree on that. Don't think it's to the book's detriment, if that makes sense. Uh, it does make sense to me. Um, so this is the second time I've listened to this. Um, and this is my third time. Okay, so you've had even more experience with it than me. I will say that my first time I listened to it, I got tripped up in a few parts. I had oh, to rewind I did this for a sure. few times. Yeah, I had to rewind it a few times because I definitely got tripped up a little bit on a couple parts. Um. However, the second time, kind of knowing what was going on, super easy to listen to and fully understand everything that was happening, I would say. I, I would say, like, I'm, I'm just going to say this now, like, if you are interested in this, I think this is a book that you need to listen to at least twice. And because just because there are things that are mentioned that you like are don't really get fully explained until like when you listen to it again and you realize like that they're mentioned and what it means. I, I just I think this is something that you you kind of need to like go into it knowing that you need to listen to it more than once if you truly want to understand everything. That's a that's a fair statement actually I think especially for this one because it's very it's pretty short. It is. I mean, short. It, it's not like we're telling you to go listen to a freaking Game of Thrones book twice. That's like forty hours yeah. long. Yeah. So um, get ready to spend eighty hours listening to something. Right. The, this is not that. I mean, so like if you were gonna take like a family trip. You could literally listen to this on the way there and then listen to it on the way back at, you know, after a week or whatever. And your second time through it is going to be a completely different experience than your first time, in my opinion. I 100% agree. But like you said, this is not easy your first time through. No, Um, it's it's not. It's really not. I mean, and I – Anybody who listens to us knows this. I listen to most of my stuff while I'm driving, so I'm not usually even like distracted. Um, but there are several parts in this where I caught myself. I might have, you know, blanked out for two minutes, and I caught myself being like, "Wait a minute, wait, what's going on? Who who's he talking to?" So that will happen if you catch yourself daydreaming or whatever. This this you will get lost very quickly, especially your first time through. Yeah, this is a very dense book for sure and i would say that that's because of the length there is right so much information packed into five hours right and i want to talk about that a little bit more after the spoilers 
Well, so with that, let's go right into our recommendations. I mean, if it wasn't obvious already. I, I'm going to say, like, this is one of my all-time favorites. And if you are a, at least even a remote fan of audiobooks, I think you have to listen to this. Fair enough. Fair enough. I hated it. Did you, are you too serious? No. <laughs> I was no. like, I was, I was about to come unglued. <laughs> no, I'm not serious. No, I, I would agree. I would, I would definitely put this on my top shelf for audiobooks. Um, and I would put this on anybody's must listen list. Uh, as far as audiobooks go. I mean, yeah. I know probably everybody's heard of this book. You know, I'm sure most people started out saying it Fahrenheit 451 like I used to. But pretty sure it is Fahrenheit 451. Well, because, yeah, it is. We'll get because it. of what it represents. I mean, that is that is why it's Fahrenheit 451. And we'll talk about that after we go past the spoilers. Um, but if you've heard people talk about it, and you want to get in on the conversation, definitely do yourself a favor and just go pick this one up and listen to it. Or better yet, if you don't have Audible already, do your 30-day free trial and start yourself off with this one, I would yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. And then you can see – because I'm going to be I'm gonna be honest with you. You're starting off on a really like high point, I think, in audiobooks. Sure. So like, if, if you enjoy this, like, there's, there's other ones that you're going to enjoy too. Sure. I mean in this – even though, like we said, it's not easy listening because it's short and because it is uh, dense. If you say started your free trial with this one and you were like, man, that was, I, you know, that was hard to follow. I didn't like that at all. Well, at least you already have it now. And then you can do like we said and listen to it again. Yeah. Which is just doing yourself an even bigger favor. I I think this is a you have to listen to it twice. I'm a, I'm gonna be honest. At least twice, I would say, because like I said, my my second listen through was a completely different experience than my first listen. Right. So yeah, go listen to it. Just go right now. Yeah, we're, seriously, we're gonna, we're gonna we're, get into it. So just leave. Yeah, we're go <laughs> listen to it and yeah, come back. Pa exactly. Pause this. Go pick this book up, listen to it, and then come back and listen to what we have to say about it. So, yeah, we're going spoilers now. All right, here we go. I, I just want to talk about, like, the way that this is written first. It is just yeah. masterfully written. There is not, like, a wasted word in the whole book. Nope. It, You're absolutely right. It is just, it's, it's like, so lovingly crafted. Like, you can tell, probably, he, he had to rewrite the same scenes, like, ten times. But he, like, like Ray Bradbury paints such an amazing picture in some scenes with, like, four words. Yep. I, I don't even understand how he does it. It's, like, especially listening to it again and, like, truly, like, understanding, like, the characters. It's, it's I don't know, it's just, it's beautiful. It really is. So <clears throat> this book opens up with our uh, main character, Montag. Guy Montag. Guy Montag. And Guy Montag is a fireman, but not a fireman like we know it. So instead of putting fires out, Guy Montag's job is to start fires, specifically to start fires to burn books. Right. That's the whole goal of what his job is. So the opening of this book Gives us Guy Montag starting a fire with his, what does he call it, a salamander? It is a salamander. So it's basically a flamethrower that uses kerosene that he douses this house with and lights this house on fire. Well, and I love the opening line of, it's a pleasure to burn. Yeah. Like, that's, so that's how the book starts. I, I love, too, the way that this opening is because we get we get this scene of guy burning this house and then he goes back to the fire station and he basically like the way he's acting is like you know he's done this a million times guy montag is too cool for school he goes back he freaking takes all his stuff off like he does every time and then he goes and he like steps through the fireman's hole with the with the pole and basically steps through it like with his hands in his pocket and he's just free falling 
And then, like, at the last second, he reaches out one hand and grabs this fireman's pole to slow himself to the ground. Yeah. Like, it doesn't get any cooler than that. Well, so, and, like, and, I mean, I mean Guy, Te- Guy Montag is kind of, like, elated a little bit after, the, like, that first burn. Because it even says he, like, he showers luxuriously, which I love. It's, like, so simple. But, I mean, like, you can tell, like, he was, he was like, having a great time in the shower. You know? Like, I don't, I don't know. I love that. Yeah. So... This, like we said, there's there's a ton of information just packed right into this kind of opening scene that we get. So then, guy after he sets the that fire, we we witness him set this fire, and then he heads home, and <clears throat> it's on his way home, right? He meets Clarice the first time. Yeah, he meets Clarice because he walks home, which is very strange during this time we really find out because uh most people drive and they not only do they drive they drive at like 120 miles an hour well do we want to talk about this world a little bit yeah that's yeah that's fine let's let's set the stage for how this kind of dystopian future works so like in the future like books are illegal nobody's allowed to read books and they have these things called parlors, which is basically like a TV, but it's like a whole wall of TV is the way I understand it. It's like a whole room. Like right. all, If you have enough money, basically all four walls are TVs. So you step into this – essentially this room where you are kind of taken to another place basically. Right. And, and but in this world, like basically everybody, it's like a world of indulgence. Like you're you're constantly watching like crazy TV shows about about nothing. Like they're not really saying anything because all the edges are rounded off, so nobody's offended. Right, and, because yeah, it's even it's even to the point that if you have the money, which I mean, these things kind of mirror the way our world works right I know, now. It's so scary. Right. So if you have the money and you can buy the best of the best. Then you're gonna buy the <clears throat> the technology that even goes so far as to change the soap opera you're watching to include your name yeah. when you're talking. And you I have mean, like lines that you read out. Right. Yeah. You can even talk back to the TVs, and it changes kind of. Or well, it doesn't change anything. That's the sad part. Is like guy's wife. It, she just talks back to the TV, and she thinks Mildred it's the most amazing thing. Yes, Mildred. But okay, so hang on. So let's go back and talk about when he meets Clarice. Okay. So he meets Clarice, and she's kind of like a – she's just a different person, and she starts talking to Montag about like different things that she's like noticing and things that her uncle has kind of told her about the world and how it used to be different than it is now. Right. Like one of the main things that she brings up, I think, this first time is like she she asks Montag if all the houses used to be fireproof, and he's like, "Yeah, houses have always been fireproof. Like that's why firemen exist only to burn books because they don't they didn't exist to need to put out fires." Yeah, because she says that I heard firemen used to put out fires right, instead of right, start right. them, and he yeah, and he's like, "That's ridiculous. Houses have always been fireproof." <clears throat> right, and so Mont- Montag kind of interacts with her a little bit, and then he goes home. And right when he goes home, that's when he finds Mildred, right? And she had tried to kill herself. Right. And so the thing, too, about this is, like, Montag is so used to kind of, like we saw in the beginning, he's going through his motions. He went and set his fire. He showered. He walked home. That's Right, but he's he's completely content. Exactly. But... This conversation that he has with Clarice starts a huge chain of events right off the bat in this book. Right, it does. Because immediately this young girl, she's only like 17, she's like talking to Montag about all these things like, hey, have you looked at the stars lately? Hey, have you, you know, noticed this? Have you noticed this? And Montag constantly is like, oh, yeah, I hadn't looked at, you know, I haven't looked up in a long time. So immediately Clarice like gets her, it gets in his head. And then he gets home and he wants to talk to his wife about you know this this girl he met who he was talking to. And yeah, he gets home and he uh finds Mildred in their room and she tried to commit suicide. 
Right, but it's so <laughs> masterfully written. Like, he doesn't say, oh, we came home and he found her in the bed. It's like, he came home and he, he saw, like, the shining cap of the pill bottle on the ground and, the, he, and like, the crystalline thing completely empty. He, even even deeper than that, which I love this, it says that when he opens the door, he knew he was going to kick something. Yeah. He didn't know what it was, but he knew in the back of his mind. And then he does. And then what he kicked was the pill cap. Yeah. That's what caused right. him to look. And I was like, oh my God, that is awesome. <laughs> but it's just like, I can't say it enough, like how well written all of this is. Sure. Like it is just, and I, the first time through, I was kind of confused what was happening at this part. Cause he doesn't really come out and say she tried to kill herself. Oh, same he, here. The, it's like we talked about this when you listen to it the second time it makes perfect sense though it does it makes it makes so much sense and he says so much with so few words right and i i love that like the guys come you know and they're like they're so blasé about it they're like oh people try and kill themselves all the time they don't even send a doctor they just send like these two techs out who like yeah. pump her stomach and right. i love the way That's... it's like a it's like a silver snake is the way he describes it so a lot of this too, and we should explain kind of why this book is a little bit more difficult to listen to, because a lot of it is Guy inner monologuing to himself. Right. So we are just privy to that information. But a lot of the information that's coming across is things that Guy is thinking to himself, not right. necessarily saying. <clears throat> and so... Like Bo said, the texts show up, they pump Mildred's stomach, and then Guy They're so blasé about it, dude. Like, they don't even right. care. Yeah, they're... <laughs> yeah, it's actually kind of sad. It yeah, is sad. Like, yeah, stuff happens all the time, and he's like, let's wrap it up here. We got another case over on whatever yeah. street. <laughs> yeah, so like, immediately, to me, I was like, oh, okay, something in this world is not right. So... The next morning, Guy gets up, and Mildred is up, and the text told Guy, they were like, she won't remember a thing in the morning. And she wakes up, and she doesn't. She's like, did we have a wild party last night? So <laughs> this is a case, too, of where Tim Robbins does so good that I hate, this, I hate this lady from the get-go. Just he he yeah. makes her sound like ditzy and airheady like she is. Oh, dude, it's perfect though. It's perfect. So, yeah, she immediately is like, "What happened last night? Did we have like a wild party? Did we have a bunch of people over?" Like, and and guy because he doesn't want to be like, "No, you tried to kill yourself again." He's like, "Yeah, we, some people came over," and she's like. Yeah, because I just don't feel very good, you know, and I just I'm really hungry. Yeah, why am I so hungry? Yeah, <laughs> see that voice. Oh. I know. And it it only it only grows as the story goes on because you find out just how miserable guy is because of what he always has to deal with on a daily right. basis. And well, but it, like, was guy miserable before all this? I do not think he was because I think he was just content with yeah, how everything too. was. Because like I said, he had he just had a routine. He'd go to work at he worked the night shift, so he goes to work at night, he sets fires all night, he showers. Well, they don't necessarily home. set fires though, like I mean, you kind of figure out through the story that the firemen aren't really doing a whole lot. Not at all. Because most of, most of the time they're at the the station they're playing cards. Yeah. Yeah, they have like a ton of time on their hands because the only time they get a call is if somebody like rats out their neighbor and it's right. like, ah, my neighbor has books in their house. I saw them or whatever. So, so yeah, Monte goes back to the station, right? The next night. Mm -hmm. And he, that's like when he interacts with the, the mechanical hound, right? Yeah. That's, that's when he uh, talks about the hound. Right. And so the, the hound is like this, I I imagine it as like kind of like the spider thing, I, like with a bunch of legs, and it's it's basically this thing that's in, incapacitates people, and it's like super fast and super deadly, and it, it, it can like do lots eight of eight legs. It has like eight legs, but it also they I'm pretty sure they call it the hound because I picture it as like a spider, 
but with like a dog's head because oh it, like it opens up uh, that's just that's i mean that's just that me, makes how sense i, it. I don't I just know i i imagine it, it like now. like with like eight legs and it has like a reservoir of like poison i don't know it's like a big circle and it's and it's just like a syringe on legs basically that could be but it I mean, does. he doesn't really come out and say exactly what it looks like, which is what I do like, that there's a lot of room for your imagination in these things. Yeah, for sure. So either way, he he interacts with the hound, and the hound acts, like, weird towards him. Because normally the right. hound is just, like, it's a robot, so it normally just, like, stands there. It doesn't really notice anyone. But this particular time, it, like, reacts to Montag right. when he, like, walks up to it. Like, it gets, like... I don't know, like a dog would like get its hackles up and get mad. And and Guy notices. He's like, whoa, that's really weird. And this is when we get introduced to Captain Beatty, isn't it? Yes. Which is one of the best characters in the book, I think. For sure. And again, thanks to Tim Robbins, though. Yeah, because... Tim, Tim Robbins voices him so well. Yeah, crushes it. <laughs> Just like, I, I can't really give him enough props. Like, he nails the whole tone of the whole book so well. Right. And don't don't mistake us saying that specifically because Tim Robbins is a famous actor. No. We are saying that because Tim Robbins nailed this book. He did. Like, it wouldn't matter who it was reading it if they did this good of a job. And trust me, we, we know a good narrator. That's the whole point of this podcast. <laughs> right. So, I mean he just he does he knocks it out of the park and it i'm glad to hear that we both completely agree on that so anyway, then so captain Beatty. yeah Ca- captain Beatty. he's he's ca- yeah he's like the leader of the firemen i mean he's he's very like this clearly like very intelligent guy that montag kind of respects we also find out we might have even found out before this the station is 451 yeah, you you find that out almost immediately, I think, because it says right, like, it's on Montag his patch. hangs up his helmet that yep. says four five one on the side. Right. So that's why the book is called Fahrenheit four five one, not four fifty one, because right. you would not you would normally stay like, you know, fire station four five one. You wouldn't say fire station four hundred and fifty one or whatever. Right. So you're like, look, I know you're looking at the title and you're like four five one. Like, what? This, this, it's crazy hot. What's this book about? It, right, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, he goes back to the station, and do they go out that night? Yeah, because uh, they get a call, because Montag talks to Beatty about that, uh, about like the things that Clarice was talking to him about. And, no, right, and how, right. That is, like, I think the call doesn't happen yet. Because no, right. I think they go through a couple nights of like playing cards, talking to Beatty, and a, and a couple nights of talking to Clarice after that. Yes, and because Montag's like, hey, so I heard that uh, you know firemen used to put out fires, and Beatty's like, yeah, right, that's no way. Houses have always been fireproof. But, so, then he, but then he rattles off a bunch of like stats. Right, because Beatty knows Montag is interested in what's in books. Right. And he's kind of always, we find out in a little bit, that he's kind of always been interested in what's in books. However, it's illegal. And it's, like, highly illegal to be interested in books. But his conversations with Clarice have really sparked it again in his head. Like, what if the information that's in books is completely different than the information I've been given my entire life? Is basically what's going through his head this whole time because they specifically say the next call that they get Montag's like off his game. He, yeah, he is. everybody else is like gone and he's just sitting at the table like by himself. And he finally gets up and goes and, and Beatty's like, Montag, you forgot your helmet. Like, yeah, he's just off his game now. Cause his mind is just somewhere else. Right. And then they go to the next place and it's like, they get there and it's kind of weird because like there's people outside and that's not normal and like it just feels weird when they go in the house and they go in the house and then somebody's in there and that's never happened to montag before right because montag says normally the cops would be there first and they would remove the people and they would usually like have them handcuffed or whatever outside before the firemen get there and and montag says it's like we were never hurting people we were only hurting things 
Right. So they go in this house and they go like to the attic or whatever and they find books. And Montag happens to be at the bottom of the stairs when the guys start throwing all these books down. And they like hit are hitting Montag like in the chest. Well, he pretty much pockets one of them. Right. He grabs one at random. Right. And then they go Beatty's like, All right, let's go, light it up, light it up. And Montag's like, Well, wait, this lady's still in here. And he's like Forget her. Let her burn. Like, just so casually. And Montag keeps telling this lady, he's like, no, come on, you need to get out of this house. Because Montag's like, this is like tearing him apart inside now. He's like, wait a minute, you know, I'm not going to set this lady on fire. And she says, no, I'd rather stay here and burn with my books. And she actually, like, sets herself on fire. Yeah, she... Yeah, because the guys are dousing everything in kerosene beforehand, and they're going to leave. And she says, no, I'd rather do this. You know, I'd rather burn with my books. Yeah, and she sets the house on fire herself with her in it. Right, and then, like, this really messes with Montag. Yeah. It, it kind of messes with all the firemen a little bit. I mean, a little we really bit. really don't get a, a look at the other firemen. But... Right. Yeah, because the whole story is, very, is told through Montag's eyes, so... Right. And so, like, Montag goes home, and he, he like, basically kind of confronts Mildred about, like, trying to kill herself. And then he's, like, he tells her, he's, like, I'm sorry, but I've done something, and you're a part of it now, whether you want to be or not. And he, like, goes to, like, a secret compartment in his house, and he has, like, 20 books. Yeah, he has a bunch of books, because now we find out that he's been taking them this whole time. Well, and didn't we get a snippet of that in the beginning? Because doesn't he come back from that first fire we witnessed him setting? And put a book away from that one, too? They don't actually, like, specifically mention him putting it away. They talk about him going, like, well, by the secret place. Exactly. And they say that he, yeah, like, you know something's up. Again, these are all things, like, if you're listening to what we're saying, if you've only listened to the book once, you got to go back through and listen again. Because they're dropping subtle hints the entire time about what's yeah. happening. Like, Ray Bradbury doesn't miss the opportunity to drop a hint that he's going to come back to later. Right. And so same thing, like, like the interaction with the hound was actually very right. important. It was important. We don't get to that until later. So like while Montag Montag is like going to stay home sick from work, he's like, I can't go back to work anymore. I just can't do it. Right. And, by, and I mean, like while we... they're, they're kind of perusing the books, Captain Beatty shows up. Well, yeah, the door the doorbell starts telling Mildred right. that Beatty is at the door. So this is where we get our real like, because I, I, even the second time through, I kind of forget that this is supposed to be like very futuristic, right? Because the scary part is it almost feels like right now, like <laughs> right, it kind of does. Um, so the doorbell starts telling them someone's there, and it says it's Captain Beatty. And so Montag puts the books away, except for one. He doesn't get the last one put away, so he puts it under his pillow while he's sitting in bed right. when Beatty comes in. And I, I kind of love this part of, like, Beatty giving, like, the whole spiel about the firemen and, like, why they exist. Because, like, basically, like, a, like the, his, his whole thing is, like, the reason they don't have books is because they don't want people thinking differently. They just Bingo. want, like, one unit. Yeah, because he says, essentially he says, like, why have books? Because, you know, this scientist writes something that says this, and then this scientist writes something that says the complete opposite. Now you got people reading both. Now you got people confused. Now you got people angry. Yeah. He said, you know, and then he says, like, uh, Irishmen don't like this book, burn it. Black people don't like this book, burn it. Right. Uh, you know, uh, left wing people don't like this one, burn it. He says it's just easier because it gets rid of all the external conflict right. that people don't need to deal with. And instead, they can just do what uh, Montag's wife Mildred does and literally stay home all day and do nothing but watch TV, essentially. Right. And I love that, like, Montag says something to Mildred. He's like, when's the last time you were really bothered? Like, truly bothered? She's like, uh, I don't know. And he's like, well, it must have been something because you, like, tried to kill yourself. Like, 
Like, I, I, you don't understand, like, that you are truly bothered. You don't even, like, you don't even know that side of yourself. Right. And she's constantly like, nope, I'm happy and I'm proud yeah. of it. She also, too, we find out shortly before Captain Beatty shows up because they have this conversation. Um, what a huge, just bitch Mildred is, basically. Yeah. So, they, in their parlor, they only have three of their four walls uh, in TVs. And she's like, oh, it'd be so nice if we could get the fourth wall installed, wouldn't it? And he's like, well, how much is it? And she's like, it's only $1,000. He's like, that's half of my year's salary or whatever. Yeah. Like, and basically all she does is literally just stay home and suck the life out of Montag. <laughs> Pretty much. But so this whole conversation with Beatty is very important because, like you said, Beatty basically tells Montag what he's going through is okay. He's like, all, all firemen get curious now and then. And he says, he explains like what their job is, like we said, that that's why they burn books, essentially, is to take out all the questions that are introduced right, to people. All the questions. Exactly. That's what that's the whole point is they burn the books because then people don't have anything to ask questions about. Right. They they tailor all the TV shows to the person watching them because then there's no questions. And guy kind of says to Beatty though, he's like, "Well, what if a fireman takes a book?" Because this whole time he's got this book under his pillow while his captain's right there. And the whole time, Mildred has felt it, and she's, like, pestering him about it. What yeah. is this? What's this? Because she's just, ugh, just the worst. <laughs> right? And Beatty says, we let, we let him keep it for 24 hours. And then after that, if he hasn't burned it, we come burn it for him. Which basically right. means we come burn your whole house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, like, as he's leaving, he's like, 24 hours, Montag. Yeah. So right there, I mean, again, I didn't catch that the first time around, but right there, uh, Beatty's on to, he knows that Montag's like, like well, the whole up. Beatty character is really interesting. I mean, we can get to the little bit later, but. So before I forget has Clarice already disappeared? Now I'm getting my time. Yeah, I I think he actually meant the captain mentions it at when he yeah, gets sees That's contact. right. Because during this talk, he tells him why Clarice is missing. Right. Because they she asks too many questions. Her and her family ask too many questions. That's essentially and so they kill her, right? Yeah, they do. But they don't say what happened to her family because her family – because they were Montag's neighbor, and he noticed that they're all gone now. Yeah. But he noticed that – he's like, Clarice is gone. Dead, I think. For some reason, he just keeps saying that. He's like yeah. – he knows in the back of his mind that, that Clarice is dead. And so, like, this really shakes Montag up. Yeah. And, like, he goes – doesn't he, like, goes out with the book for some reason – because I think he just can't be in his house. Yeah, basically. Yeah, because his wife's like, take the beetle. Go, just yeah. go drive. Take the beetle. That's what I do when I feel bad. Ugh, I got to stop doing her voice because this would make me mad. <laughs> oh, yeah. And no, like, he's like on the bus, right? And like there's this jingle for Denim's Dentifrice. Oh, and he yeah. keeps hearing it over and over. And he like loses his mind and just stands up and starts shouting. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because... This was one thing, too, the first time I listened to this, that threw me off. Yeah, so, like I said... It's kind of confusing. Uh, yeah, because, like I said, a lot of this is Montag's monologuing to himself. So, like, the Denim's Dentifrice thing, the when he starts counting, one, two, yeah. three, the bombs, one, two, like, when he does stuff yeah. like that, it, dude, the first time, it just threw me for a loop. I was like, what is, yeah, it is what's happening? But... Like we said, you listen to it the second time, you you get it. You get yeah. what's – you get it that that's just what he's – it's literally what's going on in his head. He's well, saying these yeah. things to himself. Well, and it, but like the Denim's Dentifrice is like breaking his concentration. Yeah, 
because he's got all this other shit on his mind. Right. And then this Denim's Dentifrice thing just is like playing over this loud hailer thing, I assume, because it's just it's it's just commercials everywhere. They're just, you know, trying to keep people interested in the newest thing, which is very much so like today. Yeah, and it uh is. <laughs> um yeah, so then he like just loses his shit and he like yeah, he stands up, he starts yelling at all the people like on yeah. the bus <laughs> or subway or whatever it is, I can't remember what he's on. And so then he goes to see a guy that he knows knows about books. That's right. Uh, I am having a hard time thinking of his name. I'll... Faber. Yes, that's right. That's right. Faber. He was a uh, professor. Right. And Montag had met him before when he was a fireman. Right. And he, he like, I don't know, he, like, they had, like, a weird conversation. And Faber had given him his number and his address. Yeah, and I... <sighs> I'm having a hard time recalling exactly why. Because Mont, like Montag talks to him, but Montag's like super, he's not like threatening. But Mont, Montag right. like basically lets him know he's like I know you have books, but yeah. I'm not gonna do anything about it. That's right. So, so yeah, now Montag he goes thinks to his house. Yeah, now he thinks that this Professor Faber is the only one he can kind of turn to where in when he's at his lowest, basically. Right, and he wants Faber to teach him how to understand the books, because Montag reads them, but he doesn't understand what it means. Right. Which is, I, I find it even weird that he can read. I said the same thing. I said that's weird that anybody can really read if there's no books. Yeah, I didn't really understand why he can read. So, him and Faber come up with this plan, because Faber, Faber is basically a self-proclaimed coward yeah and and faber doesn't want to do anything about the way the world is he he knows the world is wrong but he doesn't want to do anything about it um so instead what he tells montag is he says here you take this thing so in this dystopian future they talk about what do they call them now Uh, seashells yeah seashells basically headphones that go in your ears so this guy was thinking these things up back in 1951. Yeah, he was thinking of freaking headphones that go in your ears. Um, but instead uh, of a normal like blue seashell, how they always describe them, he gives him this little green one that kind of reminds me of maybe like a, uh, like a um, like a pill basically. Yeah, and sure. it goes into Montag's ear essentially. And what it is, is it's both a listening and transmitting device so that Faber can hear what's going on around Montag, as well as talk to Montag through it. Right. And what he says is he's like, this way I can listen to what's going on and I can kind of feed you information, you know, while I'm safe at home. Right. Because then they kind of come up with an idea, too. They say, well, let's turn this around on the firemen. Let's go start planting books in firemen's house and calling it in on them and ha- seeing how they like it, having their houses burned down or whatever. Right. <clears throat> and, yeah, Montag Mo- is mostly afraid to go back to the station because he thinks Beatty will sway him from how he's feeling because Beatty's really, like, silver-tongued, and he's super – he's, like, a really good talker. Sure. Yeah, and so Monte goes back to the firehouse, and like Beatty almost immediately is like he know, like he he's he kind of like reveals that he was like been on to Montag this whole time, and I love that he's like I had a dream that we were arguing about the philosophy about books, and he like he basically like lays out everything Montag would have said anyway, which I think is really interesting. Mm-hmm. We also find out a little bit more. Beatty is very well read. Yeah. So he is. Beatty is clearly a guy who reads books. Like <laughs> Right. I mean, they don't ever come out and say it, but he's constantly like quoting things out of books at people, but he knows he knows it's going to go over their head cuz nobody else knows what he's talking about. But that's kind of where Beatty like kind of is elevated above a lot of other people is because he's very well read, he's very well educated. Right. 
He also, we forgot to mention that at one point uh, at Montag's house, he hears something outside his door and he hears like mechanical sniffing under his door, which was the hound. And then once he gets back to the station, Beatty answers that. He says, what, you know, what gave it away? The fact that I sent the hound around you or whatever. So (laughs) that actually happens a little bit later. When he says that. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. See, I'm getting them mixed up now. I, I always screw it up. Just because I want to try to do it. I want to try to do it from memory and not just, you know, reiterate some summary off the internet like anybody could freaking read. Right. I don't. Are we doing that? No, and that's... We've tried to say that before. We don't want this to necessarily be just like your average book report. We're mostly trying to give our highlights and stuff of the book. So right. that's why I... Get a little confused every once in a so while. So it's fine. It's fine. Right. So that night they go on a call, and like Montag's a little out of it. He's like, "Oh man, I don't know if I can do this." And then he notices that they pulled up to his house. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and he like gets out, and like you know all the other firemen get out, and they and they tell him like, "You have to do this by yourself." And, and Montag's like, oh, he's like a little shocked. And that's that's when Beatty's like, he's like, I sent the hound around. Like, wasn't that enough warning? That's right. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. That's right. And yeah, and then like Beatty's just berating Montag, which like this is this is like the interesting part about like Beatty's character, right? Which Montag talks about it a little bit. So he's like berating Montag and Montag's holding his salamander. And so Montag just turns on him and freaking burns him to death. Yeah, he burns Beatty to death right there. In front of his house, as right. well as all the well, other firemen that are yeah. standing there. And then, like, the hound shows up, which I love the way that this is written. It's like it's like a breath of wind, and then he turns and he notices the hound is standing there. Yeah. Like, I love, I love that so much. Oh, that part's so good. How does right. he end up getting away from the hound? Why am I having a hard time he, remembering that? The hound jumps at him, and he's able to get it with his salamander and oh, that's destroy right. it. But it yeah. stabs him in the leg. That's right, yeah. And it has like a uh, some kind of like paralysis stuff in it. It's right. supposed to paralyze him. But it doesn't get him enough to like fully paralyze him. Right, but his leg like doesn't numb, work. Yeah, it numbs his leg. And then, and then this is when Montag's like, why would Beatty arm me but and then continue to berate me? When like why like why was I the only one with like that was armed at all in this scene? Like th- did Beatty want to die? Well, so and doesn't because Beatty also like freaking smacks Montag essentially and knocks the little thing out of his ear. Yeah, he does, and he picks it up. That's and right. he and he's like, I thought I seen you listening to something when you. He said, I saw you cock your head just right, and I knew you were listening to something. He said, I assumed it was just a regular seashell. And then he, Beatty puts it up to his ear so he can hear uh, Faber talking. And he's like, that's all right. We'll backtrack this. You know, we'll find this guy, too. Yeah. That's when that's when Montag's like, ah, die. He just, like, loses it, and he sets yeah. everyone on fire. <laughs> but you're right, because Montag's like, yeah, why would Beatty arm me, only me, and then sit here and berate me unless he wanted to die? Right. Like, so, like, I, I feel like there's, like, 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 ba- like ba- maybe Beatty wants to change the world, but he just doesn't have the guts to do it. Well, it's, it's like I said, I'm 95% positive that Beatty is a well-read man. Well, he, he has to be. So, Beatty is reading books. Beatty knows that what they're doing isn't right. But he, that's why he's trying to convince Montag to just go with it. Just go with it. We're not going to change it. Just go with it. Right, but it, like, like, but he wanted to die. Like, he, he basically, like, the only out he gave Montag was to kill him. Right. But that's, you're probably right, though. He probably, maybe he does want to change things. But he knows he can't. He knows there's no way that he, as a fireman, is going to change anything. Yeah, right. And, like, I think this next bit is some of, like, when... Freaking, oh, what is his name? The narrator really shines. Tim Robbins. Tim Robbins. Like, the part when he's when he's trying to cross the street. Oh, yeah. Is, is so well narrated, dude. It's right. amazing. 
So it's Montag, amazingly dumb. Basically, Montag goes on the run because obviously he just murdered all these people, and he they know he has books, so he's you know he's now a fugitive. And as he's running, like like we said in the beginning, it's very rare to see people out walking. So he sees a car coming down the road super fast because cars are drive insanely fast in this and it's awesome because the car is going so fast but we get so much thought in montag's yeah. head <laughs> um because montag assumes it's the police after him right away you know he thought they caught him like right away uh and it ends up being just like teenagers trying to scare him but it no, was... they were trying to kill him oh yeah because they he jumps right at the last second oh, he it runs falls. Like... Like his his finger or something over. <laughs> yeah. His, yeah. Like he gets he's, tread on his fingers. That's right. But just yeah. just the way like he's because fr- it's so frantic the way he's crossing the street. Yeah. And like yeah. the the narrator totally like picks up on all that franticness and it's it's so well done. Yeah. It's amazing. Exactly. I I agree. Yeah. That's and like you said, that's kind of where Tim Robbins really shines in this because he could have just read it, but he could have. He puts so much inflection in it. I mean, that's the best part. It is the, the best part. The way he the way he puts his inflections in. So Montag so, like, barely makes it away. And then he he meets up with Faber and Faber like tells him to like go to the old train yard and like follow it for a ways. Yeah, because Faber's basically like, you have to get out of town. Because what they start doing, this is what this is where it gets kind of scary, like it is super very scary. Very Orwellian type stuff, you know, George Orwell type 1984 shit is uh, Montag hears over the um, whatever it is. I can't remember how he hears it now. Basically through everybody's stuff, because 99 percent of the people are always just in their house watching their TV at any given time. Right. It kind of made it seem like there aren't a lot of jobs other than like going to war and being a fireman. (laughs) Right. So he basically this the deal tells like the TVs tell everyone to look outside because it right. says if if we all look for him, somebody's going to see him or find him. So it and it does like a countdown. Yeah. And I was like, oh, like because I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, they could almost do that today. Like if some emergency, I mean, think about when your phone goes off and says emergency, whatever in your area. I mean, we're doing it for the right reasons we think, but it's no different than this. It's no different than turning everybody against the one guy who essentially is the good guy. Like, (laughs) right. Yeah, it is pretty scary. Yeah. That part gives me just like, it gives me like goosebumps thinking about it because it's so it's like terrifying. It's super terrifying. And so Montag is able to get away, he like floats down this river. Well, because gets... they, they sent another hound after him. Right. That's right. And it has like his specific amino acid thing, so it's like able to track him no matter what. Right. And the news is constantly saying the hound never fails. Yeah. That's an important an important thing to remember, and we're going to find out why. Right, it is. So Montag escapes, and he floats down the river, and he uh, finds the railroad tracks, and he starts following them. Right, and, and he, then he uh, follows them for a ways, and he, like, notices, he, like, hears people in the woods, and he, like, goes and he meets them. And they're like a bunch of runaways like him who who are all pretty like well read professors throughout the world. Right. They essentially are him, basically. Right. They did the same thing. They knew that books are important and that learning things is important and they didn't want to be oppressed, so they left the cities. They they specifically say the cities because right. We also find out at this part because they say that all the railroad tracks are abandoned. So what I'm picturing is like essentially like New York City crammed into this small area 
and then nothing outside of that. Yeah, that's kind of the picture I get too. You know, it basically goes from like New York City high rises to farmland. Is, right. Is is basically what it is. There's no petering out lower buildings all the way out to suburbs. None of that. So they do a very good job too of keeping the people very concentrated, like <laughs> very easy to watch, essentially. Right. Yeah, which makes sense. Right. So he like he meets with these people and they ask him like if he has any books and he's he's like no but I read I read this one and they're like oh well good we can actually recall it all from your memory so uh, we actually have a copy of it now yeah well they say like oh we already have a guy who who is that book but right. should something happen to him you are now that book and we we find out that that's how that's their plan is. They don't need to physically keep the copies. As long as one person remembers one book, they can, once the world changes, they can start to reprint them all as long as yeah. one person remembers the book. And they basically say, we're waiting for the war to start. Right. Like, this part in its, in a way is very confusing because... These guys are all like runaways. They we find out they've been runaways for a long time, but basically they know at some point the war, which we've been hearing about the bombers flying over and stuff, but we find out that they're waiting for the war to truly start, and the war, just so happens that when Montag shows up to their little group is when the war starts. Yeah, because don't they say that we're waiting for the war to start any minute now? I think it actually starts like when he sees Faber. He's like, "Didn't you hear the war's on?" Oh, oh that's right. Which was also very kind of Orwellian. Like, oh yeah, we're at war now. Like, right, it is kind of what it seems like. We should also mention too. They have this little TV, and they tell Montag because they give him this pill that will like basically scramble his his uh, DNA makeup so that the there's no way the Hound could ever track him again. He said, like, you take this thing, and in 10 minutes, you'll be two different people or something like that. Right. And, uh, but they're like, they're like, no, watch this. Like, uh, don't worry. The hound isn't going to follow you anymore. And he's like, well, what do you mean? They said, no, check this out. You know, the, yeah, the hound dark. always, right? So this part scares me too, because it's, I feel like it's kind of how the world works today, especially. Uh, they say, no, check this out. Like, you know, the hound never fails. And he said, the guy telling him is like, they have to uphold that. So he said, watch, I bet you the hound finds you in the next five minutes. And Montag's like, what are you talking about? So they watch this like live video feed from like a drone, essentially. And it like zooms in on this guy. And they're like, we have found the fugitive Montag. And then the hound comes out of nowhere and kills this guy. Yeah. Well, straight it's up just, murders him. Yeah. It's just some random guy. Yeah. And the guy in the woods explains to Montag, he says, no, that guy is probably a little bit different. He's probably like us. He's probably been out walking every day. And they notice that. The government notices things like that. So he's a bit of an odd duck. So they needed to deal with him anyways. And what better way? than to kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, it's pretty messed up. It's super dark. Basically, they set up a scapegoat to make the population think that they caught Montag, even though he totally got away. Yeah, it's it's pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying. Does anything else happen? Uh, yeah, the war starts, right. and the freaking city that Montag just left is bombed into oblivion oh, right, right in front of his explode. eyes yeah it's literally flattened to the freaking earth and i like the little bit of what the guys tell him then because they're like you know they basically all get up because they feel like the blast from where they are even though they're way outside the city and they basically get up and they dust themselves off and they say see now it's time to start again. This is how yeah. man always does it. We always destroy ourselves. He, said, he basically compares us to a phoenix. 
because they said we always destroy ourselves just to be reborn again. But the sad part is that the Phoenix doesn't know why he's doing it, and man knows exactly why. Right. It's some seriously deep shit, like in the last literally like six minutes of the it's, book. It's all pretty deep. It, it really is. And it especially – it's deep and it's like terrifying because like very similar to 1984, you know, these books were written so long ago and yet are hitting so many check marks for yeah. how we're living right now in 2020. And that's basically it. And then Montag finds yeah, out that's... that they're going to go and they basically now they're going to go start printing books again because the city is destroyed. Right. Yeah, it's it's good. It's super good. And I'm sure uh -huh. most people don't even need us to tell them that. Probably because not. most people have probably read and or heard this. Well, most likely people have read this book, but. Do yourself a favor. Even if you've read it, just go ahead and let Tim Robbins read it to you. Because yeah, let, let Tim so Robbins good. read it to you. He does such a good job. <laughs> he does an amazing job. Yeah. Masterclass. For sure. And that's, you know, like we said, we have a few favorites as far as, you know, narrators go. But I would definitely put Tim Robbins at the top now. Yeah, I think I have to, too. And he doesn't really narrate much else. Which is a shame. No, which is a shame. And Tim Robbins, if you hear this, just start doing more books, man. Just please. No need to. Don't even. You don't even need to act anymore, man. Just do some more books. Yeah. We'll review them. And yeah. It'll all be, be good. Set, dude. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that's Fahrenheit four five one. It is, and now. If you listened to this through all the way and you hadn't listened to the book yet, shame on you and yeah. go listen to the book. Super shame. But we're not kidding either when we say this this one is worth the money because of the experience you're getting. Don't right. do yourself a disservice and just go look this up on YouTube and listen to some freaking schmo read this in his basement like this this is a classic book read to perfection. It is. Yeah, it is it is completely read to perfection. That's a good way to put it. So Yeah. Um and with that, uh if anybody would like to get a hold of us and tell us what you thought, you know, K O T P L dot pod at gmail dot com. We're still waiting on our first real email from anyone. Yeah. <laughs> from anyone. Uh, you guys can go, you know, we got a couple other spots you can check us out too. You can check us out over on Facebook, Knights at the Pageless Library, uh, YouTube. I have, I re upload these to YouTube. So, Knights of the Pageless Library over there, you could go over there and like, comment, subscribe, do all that good YouTube stuff if that's the way you like to listen to stuff. Um, and we also have a Discord. Uh, but to get into the Discord, you got to get your library card. Yeah, you so, have to. <laughs> You gotta email me and let me know, and I will send you a Discord invite, and you can get over there and get in on the conversation with us. Yeah, and I think with that, let's, I think we're good. What are we doing next time, Bo? You know oh, what we yeah. haven't done. You know what we haven't done in a while, and what? let's see. An audible original. Yeah, and the Friday the third was when the new audible originals came out. Should we see what's available for Audible Originals? Sure. So I'm looking at A Woman of the World, The Mountain and the Sea, The Man on the Mountaintop, Second Skin. Oh, well, there's actually eight. Uh, the Golden Orchard. How to Build Meaningful Relationships Through Conversation. <laughs> Finding Tess. A Murder of Manatees. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, we have to do a murder of manatees, man, because that's part of the Tom Stranger interdimensional insurance agent. Oh, it sure is. Okay, so we're going to do... Let's do that one next. We'll do a murder of manatees next. 
Okay. And then... Let's see. Um, what were those other ones? Let's do... I don't know. You pick one. I just picked that one. Oh, I don't know, man. Let's do second skin. Second skin. Okay. So there you go, people. Those will be the uh, next two we take a look at most likely. And then uh, probably in the next one, we'll, we'll let you know what actual novel we're going to do next because we like uh, people to listen ahead of time if they choose to do it that way. So, but yeah, with that one, you know, I think we could wrap this one up. Yeah, especially hopefully, since my kids are knocking on my door yeah. right now. Hopefully we'll <laughs> catch you guys in the next one. Yes, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. Bye.